Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Macy O. Lewis, one of the elders here at Cumberland Church, and I have the privilege and the honor of being able to, to share a message with you this morning. I want to just give thanks to Courtney, Pastor Courtney for uh, allowing me this opportunity again to share a message with you this morning. So before we look at God's word, why don't we um, open up with a word of prayer? Our Father and our God, Lord, we give all glory and honor to you, thanking you, Lord God, for your word. And Lord, praying that you, Lord God, would minister to us through it. Uh, Lord, may your will be done, Lord God, and may you be glorified in all that is said and done. We praise your holy and your righteous name, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I'm going to read some verses to you, and I want you to listen for the common theme that runs through them all. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. Let your compassion come to me that I may live, for your law is my delight. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Streams of tears flow from my eyes, for your law is not obeyed. I long for your salvation, Lord, and your law gives me delight. Some of you all probably figured out that those verses come from Psalm 119, which is the longest psalm in the Psalter. And you probably noticed that the common theme that runs throughout those verses was the psalm's desire and love for God's law. Um, my, last year, my family and I and a few friends, uh, we did a 22-week Bible study through uh, the, the Psalm 119. And it was, it was truly a joy, really enjoyed going through that Psalm and looking at it in depth. Uh, but I'll be honest with you, there were times where there was a little tension because the psalmist had such love for God's law that I think there were times where we really didn't quite know how to respond as those being under grace. And so it's, it's almost like, are we supposed to love the law as, as, as he's loving it? Or, or are we just supposed to um, just uh, think of it as loving God's word and not necessarily his law? I'm sure many of you express your love for God's grace on a regular basis, which, which we should. Uh, but the question is, have you ever expressed your love for God's law? Have you ever expressed your love for his law at, like the psalmist has, where he, he's just declaring his love for, for God's law and his, his desire for God's law, and it just breaks his heart to see uh, God's law being uh, disobeyed? Few things probably raise more questions uh, in the Christian community than the place of the law in, in a Christian's life, whether uh, knowing that we're under grace and we're dead to, to the law and and so I think there's always, there's just this tension of what place does the law have in the life of a believer? Not only do we struggle to know what to do with the law at times in our own lives and how we should respond to it, but even early believers uh, struggle with the same thing as well. In fact, there was probably even more tension for those who were Jewish because the law was not just a list of commandments, it was the very heart and the very fabric of their life. I mean, everything centered around their lives. I mean, the law, uh, there were laws from, from keeping the Sabbath to, to offering sacrifices, from working in the field to how to, how to uh, uh, deal with their neighbors. Uh, all of these things, their lives were just governed by God's law. But now that the kingdom of God has arrived with the message of grace, what role should the law play in the lives of God's people? The good news is Jesus has some answers for us today in his word. Through the message, Jesus shows us that the law still has a place in the lives of those saved by grace. We'll look at Matthew chapter five again. We're, we're still continuing our series uh, on Jesus's Sermon on the Mount. And we'll look at verses 17 through 20. I'll read those again. And it says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. 
Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Wow. I mean, we look at Jesus sermon on the mount and he's really jumping right into the law and he's really providing clarity in regards to his 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 kingdom and the law. And immediately we see that Jesus makes it clear where he stands with the law. He already he already knows the heart of the people, that there's questions stirring up with the people. And he says, do not think that I've come to abolish the law. No, that's not what I've come to do. I have come to fulfill and and, and not to abolish it. Before we look further at that, I want you to notice something else that we might sometimes overlook. When we look at Jesus starting out, it says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law. Notice Jesus's authority. I mean, Jesus is speaking with authority, something that no one else, no other prophets, no other rabbis, no other teachers were doing at that time or speaking in that manner. Even to the point that after the Sermon on the Mount, people were, it said that Matthew said that people were amazed because of the authority at which Jesus spoke. And so we see this authority. It's not only what Jesus says about the law that's important, it's how he says it. This is uh, just, just remarkable. I think it reminds me of the, garden, the, the, the Gethsemane incident where Peter is there and Jesus is about ready to be uh, taken away, uh, to be crucified. And Jesus says, do you not think that I, that, that I cannot appeal to my father? and he will at once send more than 12 legions of angels, that's authority. And then he says, but how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it may be so? So pay attention to that. We see Jesus's authority in this particular passage where he says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law, almost as if to say, though I can abolish the law, that's not what I came to do. I came to fulfill the law. That's, the, that's authority. And alone that is worthy of our worship. Notice how Jesus mentions both the law and the prophets. Typically, whenever Jews mention both the law and the prophets, they were referring to what we commonly think of as the Old Testament. Generally, they will refer to the law as what we see as the Torah, the first five books of our Bible. And then the, the, the prophets be making up the major and the minor prophets. When we speaking of Elijah and Jeremiah and all these just different prophets, Haggai, we see those uh, making up our Bible. So when Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, he's not just thinking strictly of just commandments, but he's talking about the entire Old Testament. In saying that he came to fulfill the law and the prophets, Jesus is letting us know that everything in the Old Testament points to him. Everything points to him. Every story, every, every narrative, everything that is unraveling in throughout the Old Testament points to him. In other words, the law is not history. It's his story. That it's, uh, certainly we can get technical and say it is history because it happened in the past, but Jesus is letting us know that it's not just history. It's his story. It's God's ever revealing story of, of how he will send his son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us from our sin. And we see that throughout every single book in the Old Testament and prophets, they speak to God's redemptive plan through Jesus Christ. You can trace that common thread and that common theme throughout each of the 39 books in the Old Testament. Reading the Old Testament laws and prophets with Christ in mind helps us to rightly interpret the purpose of the law and the prophets. Without that understanding, there's just no harmony. But when you see the Old Testament through the lens of Christ and, and how he is mentioned, not just in the messianic passages, but in every single story, that was uh, one, if not one of the main issues the Pharisees and the religious leaders struggle with. They mistook the law as the end. And not only did, did they not see Christ, they misinterpreted God's intention for the law. They couldn't see that the law and the prophets was more than just about keeping tradition and commandments and, and that they passed and, and that, that it wasn't something just to be passed on from generation to generation. It was about the very son of God. 
Matthew even gives us a picture of this later in his gospel and what we know of Jesus uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17. You remember when Jesus took his three disciples, Peter, James, and John, those in his inner circle with him on the Mount of Transfiguration, and who was joined with Jesus Christ, none other than Moses and Elijah. Moses representing that Old Testament, uh, not the Old Testament, but yeah, Moses representing the law and Elijah representing the prophets. And it was as if Matthew is just bringing attention to that later on in his, in his book in saying that, look, there's someone greater that has come. The law and the prophets all point to Jesus Christ. When you read the Old Testament and the narratives and the Psalms, do you see Jesus or do you only see Elijah and Moses? Do you see Jesus Christ throughout the scriptures? Are you reading it like it's a history book or God's divine revelation of the coming King. Look for your savior. King Jesus is in those pages. He's there. I know we can kind of get hung up on some of the cultural differences between then and now, but look through that to God's message and see the King. He is there. That's what the law was to point us to Jesus Christ. I'm amazed every time I look through the Old Testament stories because it's a constant reminder of God's faithfulness and his love and even our disobedience. I like what St. Augustine said. He's, he's credited with the popular saying that is fitting. He says, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. I think that's so fitting because the message of Christ is concealed in every single story in the Old Testament. The Old Testament law is his story because Jesus alone brings purpose, meaning, and clarity to everything that happens in the Old Testament. The story of Abraham getting ready to sacrifice his son Isaac points to how God will willingly sacrifice his son, Jesus Christ, for us. The story of Moses leading the people of Israel out of bondage from slavery uh, is how God will deliver us from the bondage of sin through Jesus Christ. Even the story of Esther, where God's name is not even mentioned, where she is interceding for her people before King Xerxes, points to how Jesus Christ will intercede before the Father for those who put their faith in him. It all points to Jesus Christ. Not only does the law point to Jesus, it's a constant reminder of our need for Jesus. We see much brokenness in the Old Testament through God's law, we see much brokenness and even the inability of God's people to keep God's law perfectly. As we read those stories of Israel, Israel's inability to keep the law, we're confronted with our own shortcomings. But there is hope because we see God's promise of salvation. There is hope. God doesn't just leave us hopeless, but he says that there is a coming king that is going to bring salvation to those who put their faith in him. This Law, it kind of reminds me of a situation we recently faced at our home. Uh, we had, uh, I noticed that our water bill was, was steadily increasing. It was going up month to month. And so I knew that there was maybe something going on. Either they were overcharging us or something was going on. So I called the water company and they kind of gave some directions and some guidance on how to isolate uh, whether there's a leak in the house or outside the house. And so eventually what we did was we uh, were able to isolate it outside the house. So it was in the water line between the main and the house. And so the first thing that they said you got to do or that, that you need to do uh, is to call someone who does uh, is leak detection. A leak detection person will come out and they, they come out, they have this device and they're just kind of scanning over the ground looking for or listening for where the leak is in the water line. And now after they find the leak, then you have to call the plumber out, and that's what we had to do to come and actually fix the actual leak. So we did that, and you would have thought that it was over with, but it wasn't because the plumber said, guess what? There's another leak somewhere in the line. And so what did we have to do? We have to call out the person who does the leak detection again, and he finds another leak. This time it's under the driveway. And so we have to call the plumber back out, and they go through the process of saying, you just need to run a new line from the main to the house. And that's exactly what we did, right under the driveway. But when I think about the law, the law is like that leak detection person. He doesn't do anything else but find that leak. He doesn't fix the leak. He tells you where the leak is and he can give recommendations on who can fix the leak, but that's it. And that's what we see 
uh, with the Old Testament and the law and the purpose that it still serves in the lives of believers and those who don't know Christ, is it pointing to Jesus Christ? It finds those leaks. It, the, the law, it, it points us to the only one who can fix our leaks and gives us living water through Jesus Christ. Although Jesus fulfilled the law, notice that it didn't change the fact that the law would remain. Jesus Christ said he didn't come to abolish but fulfill the law. But in verse 18, Jesus talks about that there's, he says that not an iota, not the, even the smallest letter of the Greek alphabet or the, the, uh, or the dot of the law will pass away from the law until everything is accomplished. Not just his work on the cross, but even up through his second coming. Not even the, the dot in the letter I will fade away until everything is accomplished. And so Jesus is establishing that the law still has a place in the lives of those who are saved by grace. Jesus moves from how he will respond to the law to how we're to respond to the law. And he starts by issuing a warning. And as we look at this particular verse in verse 19, the next point being made here is that the law is not a to-do list. It's his call to do his will. It's not a to-do list. And sometimes that's the way we may approach the law, like it's a checklist and, and I have to do this and I have to do that. That's not the intention of the law. It's, it, it, Christ wants us to understand the spirit of the law, which is to, to, uh, to do his will. So in verse 19, it says, therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. There are a couple things that kind of stand out in this verse right away. And, and one of the things that jumps out as we read this verse is that there appears to be some sort of distinction in God's kingdom that is based on how one responds to the law of God, to, to God's commandments. There's some distinction there that Jesus made and says that those who take God's law lightly, who don't follow his word, who are not committed to his keeping his commandments. He says that that those are the ones who will be called least in the kingdom. But those who are faithful to practice it and to teach it, he says, those are the ones who are called great in the kingdom. Man, that's that's just an interesting saying. It's hard to say exactly what this actually looks like in the kingdom, but I believe it somehow reflects the reward that the saints will receive in heaven because of their faithfulness to God's word. Whatever that looks like, the important thing is Jesus warning against taking any of his commandments lightly. That's the that's the main point here. So although we're saved by grace, that grace doesn't exempt his people from obeying his word. In fact, it's because of his grace that we're now free from the power of sin and empowered by the Holy Spirit to live according to his will. And so Paul said it this way in Romans 6, 14 through 16. He says, for sin shall be no longer, shall no longer be your master because you're not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? Christ has freed us from not only the penalty, but the power of sin as well. And that allows us to live in a new way revealed to us by Jesus Christ. Jesus has fulfilled the law and has called us to follow him and to do his will in obedience. I like what the late R.C. Sproul said. He said, the gospel saves us from the curse of the law, but in turn directs us back to the law to search its spirit, its goodness, and its beauty. The law of God is still a lamp under, under, unto our feet. Without it, we stumble and trip and grope in darkness. That is so true, how the gospel saves us. And though we're no longer under the law, it's like it turns us back in that direction to the law to show the true spirit and, the, and to see the true beauty of the law. As we look at this verse, it's important that we look at it in light of what Jesus revealed to us in verse 17, where he says he came to fulfill the law. So Jesus is not trying to put an added weight on those who put their faith in him, but he's really calling us to a spirit of obedience. He has fulfilled the law, not so that we don't have to, but that we would know what true obedience looks like in the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know if, if it's just me, but when, I'm, when I first looked at this particular verse, 
I, one of the things that stood out to me was just how it's indicated that those who didn't practice or kind of took God's law lightly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So when uh, the question I have for you is when Jesus said you will still be in the kingdom, but be called least, what were you thinking? Were you thinking that as long as I get into the kingdom of heaven, I'm OK with that. I can be called least. I can be called great. I don't know if it's just me, but that's one of the things that quickly comes to my mind at times. It's like, man, as long as I'm in heaven, everything is OK. And so if I'm honest with you, it kind of entered my mind when I looked at that text. So while I can understand that chain of thought, it, it brings to light, I think, an important truth that we need to consider. This verse is not only warning, uh, a warning, but it's also a litmus test because it reveals the condition of our heart. If we're more concerned about getting into heaven than we are about doing his will here on earth, it might just reveal that we don't love the Lord as much as we think we do. And that's what we see throughout the Gospels is, is Jesus re revealing to us that one who truly loves him are those who are obedient to him. Just after Jesus told the disciples that he would go to prepare a place for them, he left a word for his disciples to remember for measuring their love. And it wasn't the amount of faith that they had, though the two go hand in hand. They're, they're not in conflict, but he focused on love because in John chapter 14, verse 15, he says, if you love me, keep my commands. What's the condition of your heart? Are you more concerned about getting into heaven than obeying his word. That's what Jesus is really, um, really trying to uh, ask us is that that question and getting to the root of the matter. When we see him saying that you would still get into heaven, uh, but you'll be called the least. How, how do we really respond? What's the first thing that comes to our mind? Keeping his commandments is a measure of our love for Jesus. And love reflects the true spirit of the law. Jesus reminds us of this in Matthew 22. When he was asked by a Pharisee, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Does that look familiar? We just look, we, we, that's what we're focusing on. The law and the prophets says all of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now, some of you, if you are like uh, thinking that, man, yeah, that's where I feel. I, I, I really don't have a love for God's law. I really, I'm, I, I struggle with being faithful and obedient to him. I want to be in the kingdom, but I'm not necessarily committed to his will. Love is the key. If your motivation for doing his will is not fueled by love, call out to him. He never turns away those who turn and call on his name. That's the good news. Jesus Christ is so gracious and so merciful and so faithful that if you just turn to him and pour your heart out to him, he will respond. He will embrace you. He will meet you where you are. We serve a great savior. We serve a savior who, who knows where we're at and is willing to, to walk with us through those, those challenges and those struggles that we have. Jesus transitions from warning those who make too little of the law to those who make too much of the law. It's just interesting how he does this in verse 19. He, he shifts from addressing those who adhere to, to what's called antinomianism to those who adhere to legalism. Antinomianism, just a big word that really speaks to those who are against the law. Nomos meaning is a Greek word for law and anti against. And so that was a, a dangerous doctrine in the early church and even throughout today where folks just focus on the grace and they say, I don't have to worry about the law. That, I, we don't have to keep any, do any of the laws, keep any laws or be faithful to, to obedience, just grace, all grace. And that's it. And so that's that danger. So he shifts from focusing on that and giving a warning to those who take his word lightly to those who adhere to legalism. And so in verse 20, it says, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus turns his attention to those who have been who have been the wrong role model 
to the people for keeping the law, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And man, it is just so hard for us to truly understand the significance of this verse. Because if you were a Jew and Jesus Christ said that at that time on the Sermon on the Mount, you would have been blown away. I mean, it had to be a, an attention getter. I can imagine there were rumblings and gasps through the crowd when Jesus made this statement. Because if there was anyone that people felt that had a clear path to the kingdom of heaven, it was the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Their lives would have been what people measured themselves against. So I can imagine people thinking, man, if they can't, if they're not going to get into heaven or if my righteousness needs to exceed theirs, then what hope is there for me? The Pharisees, they were extremely diligent about keeping God's law. In fact, Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, he wrote that the Pharisees are esteemed most skillful in the exact interpretation of the law. Unlike what was mentioned in verse, verse 19, the, I can imagine the Pharisees, they, would have been accused, they wouldn't have been accused of relaxing the law. In fact, when Jesus talked about keeping, every, uh, keeping the law and practicing the law, the Pharisees might have been like, hey man, I'm down with that because that's what they were for. So the people had to be wondering, man, what, what hope is there? The hope is found in the Lion of Judah. The hope is found in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not saying that your, your right, that your, your, your good deeds or practicing the law is what is going to get you into the kingdom of heaven. That's not what he's saying. The point Jesus is making is that the law is not your righteousness. It's, your, it's his righteousness in you. It's not your righteousness, the law and keeping the law. That's not your righteousness. And that was, the, that was the point of issue. One of the point of issues with the Pharisees was self-righteousness. They felt that keeping the law is what brought them into favor with God. And Jesus Christ was bringing clarity to the picture now that the kingdom of God was here. And he said, no, that's not what the law does. And that never was the intention of the law uh, because God knew that we couldn't keep it. Paul has a lot to say about this in Romans. And one thing in particular stands out in Romans chapter eight, verses three through four. He says, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Praise God for his grace and his mercy. So though the law still has a place in the life of those saved by grace, we need to make sure it's in the right place, that we don't look to the law or look to good works that we do to think that that gains us favor with God. The only um, favor that we gain to God is through faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. The gospel is good news because Jesus not only died for our sins, but his light, his, his righteousness was credited to us as well. That is good news so that when God looks at you and me, he doesn't see he doesn't see our works. He sees the work of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. It doesn't matter how many good works we do. We must never see those good works as the reason for dwelling with, the, with God in the kingdom of heaven. It's by grace alone, through faith alone. Truth be told, we can't look down on the Pharisees. We can only say, if not for the grace of God, there go I. For the truth of the matter is we were all in the same boat until grace penetrated our hearts. We too were trusting in our own righteousness uh, until Jesus Christ came into our life and the, the, the message of the good news penetrated our hearts. The law still has a place in the lives of those saved by grace but it's only through our relationship with Christ can the law be used as God intended. In the remaining chapter, Jesus reveals how that law was intended to be used. As we see that on throughout, Jesus Christ shows them not just only positional righteousness, which only comes through faith in Jesus Christ, but practical or progressive righteousness as well that we that we see in the lives of those. And so when you deal with anger and you deal with lust and all of these things, Jesus is, is going to show how that righteousness looks in the life of those who have been saved by grace. And so praise God for the good news. I pray that uh, you will 
uh, see that God is still saying that we need to be obedient to his word. Uh, each week we uh, observe uh, and remember Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. And as we, re as we look to um, the, taking the communion and, and, and taking the bread and the juice this week, think about how Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross paid for your sins. Now, we're only able to remember what Jesus Christ did and his, his work on the cross was only satisfactory to, the, to, the, to God the Father because he fulfilled all 613 uh, laws that are, that are listed in the Old Testament. That's a lot of laws. And to think that Jesus Christ didn't sin not once, not in deed, not in thought, not in any way, but he was perfect. And because of that, he rose again in three days. And because of that, we too have new life. We, we are new creations in Jesus Christ. And so as we come to take the bread, let us remember the body that was broken for you and for me uh, so that we would have life. Let us take the bread. And let us also uh, think about the blood that Jesus shed on the cross because of his love for you and for me. The love that nailed him to the cross, that kept him on the cross when he could have gotten down. It was love that hung him up, that kept him there. Let us drink the juice. Let us pray. Oh Lord, our God, how excellent is thy name. We praise you, Father, for you, Lord God, through the course of time, um, working your redemptive plan that, Lord, we would uh, see your son, Jesus Christ, and uh, have the opportunity to dwell with you in the kingdom of heaven. We thank you, Lord God, that it is through faith in, in, in Jesus Christ that we uh, can know you. And, and But Lord, I pray, Father God, that you, Lord, will continue to minister to our hearts. Show us how we are to uh, live in obedience to you, Lord God, uh, that we, Lord, will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. We thank you and we praise you, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.